Hi, I'm David Sherbuck. I'm a, a former uh, tech editor and reporter at, at Forbes magazine and now a, a freelance uh, tech journalist. I'm here today with Aravind Ganapatharaju. Did I get that correct, uh, Aravind? Yeah. Yes. Um, from Unifor, um, a, a company based in India which provides conversational uh, uh, AI technology. Um, and I'll let Aravind describe what Unifor does a little more precisely, and we'll uh, have a, a conversation to, today about what's up and coming in, in the field of artificial intelligence. So, Aravind, welcome. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so, yeah, Unifor, uh, you know, actually, even though its roots are in India, it's headquartered in uh, Palo Alto, California. Uh, and we are in the space of conversational AI. That's our uh, primary area of work. And uh, we provide uh, products uh, cloud centric uh, where enterprises can gain efficiencies and insights out of their conversational data uh, from their contact centers or in their enterprise environments itself. Interesting. And I understand from that you go beyond sort of the, the, the usual voice response or automated response systems um, and that your technology even can detect sort of the tonal or the emotional uh, aspects of a conversation. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the you know latest uh, product lines that uh, we have released is uh, called Q for sales. Um, so what Q for sales does is in an enterprise multi-speaker environment, such as the call that we are having right now, uh, it actually lets you gain insights about the engagement levels of each of the participants and provides you nudges on how, you, how to get better engagement by looking at the tonal information uh, from the speakers um, and uh, more importantly, the visual cues as well. So we do actually process the the video, look at your facial expressions and you know do analysis and do a fusion of cues that we are getting from video, from audio, from text, and then you know provide insights and uh, nudges to have a better outcome in the call. That's that is fascinating. I, I did. I had no idea that that the technology advanced to that point. So you're using a combination of natural language processing and machine vision yeah. to look at the visual cues and combine it with the audio. That's fascinating. Yeah. Can you can you tell us a, a little bit about your role at Unifor and how you became interested in in the field of artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I, I would, uh, you know, call myself a dinosaur in this area at this point, because I've been in, in the speech area for over 25 years now. Uh, my PhD was uh, an attempt at using one of the uh, early machine learning uh, breakthroughs called support vector machines. Uh, my uh, dissertation was about using that for speech recognition. That was one of the first works in that area. Uh, so I've ever since been in the area of speech recognition and uh, slowly transitioned to NLP and other aspects of conversational AI. Um, uh, prior to Unifor, I was at uh, Genesis uh, responsible for their applied AI. And what that means is unlike uh, core research, applied AI yeah, is the bridge between research and product productization of ideas. Uh, to cater to different use cases. So we look at model efficiencies, model efficacy, uh, new features that are required uh, to make machine learning successful. Because as, as we all know, there's a lot more to machine learning than the actual model. In fact, model is a very small part of uh, the success story. And what is, so if that's a small part, what's the big part? The big part, you know, in my opinion, on what makes it successful or not is actually the tooling and the infrastructure to serve the models into production and uh, capturing the feedback from the field as the system gets used so that we can 
feed that back into the mothership and improve the models on a con- continuous basis nice. all that requires a lot of infrastructure work and uh, software and cloud engineering which is really a much bigger part than the actual modeling work now in, in discussion with some of the other panelists who are going to be uh, presenting at, at wow ai's webinar uh, next month uh, we we've talked about how artificial intelligence is a field started with a lot of promise in in the 1980s and then seemed to go into a bit of a a, a dark age but is now in a renaissance of sorts um mm-hmm. dating back let's say 7 years to the introduction of Amazon Alexa what do you think are the factors that are leading to this sudden uh golden age of AI where everything from Alexa to auto complete to uh mm. self-driving cars are suddenly a reality and becoming almost ubiquitous yeah a couple of things i would say uh, one is just the compute power right neural networks if you had the term neural network in your proposal in the 80s and 90s most probably it will be next right you right. you have no chance of getting funding uh whereas in the 2000s and beyond you know the compute power just you know caught up became very accessible uh we just helped mushroom a whole wave of uh, engineers and scientists uh, really start using machine learning for all sorts of things including asr you know um uh, the first asr system that uh, we built we on conversational speech we were at around 40% word error rate that's the metric that's used for speech recognition uh, on that same task today we are pushing 5% word error rate wow. and humans transcribing that data itself do make about 5% you know errors so we are literally there i'm not saying it's a solved problem but that's the you know evolution that has happened in the two decades i see fascinating so CPU power what what role has the cloud played in in making these uh, or making AI enabled applications a possibility Yeah so cloud has again made uh, available the compute a lot more easily uh, if if every researcher had to buy a GPU in instance it's just impossible right? right whereas you know the cloud just makes it truly democratizes AI uh, to some extent and it has also helped um, you know build a thriving open source community uh, that's been a big part of this and that's why all the big companies like the facebooks and the googles of the world are so active in the open source as well because they know the more we democratize some of these big leaps in technology uh the faster the progress will be and cloud has been an enabler for that um in in within your industry what ai strategies um what are the, sort of the latest ai strategies that are being implemented to align with global standards uh the big uh, transformation that's happening today is going with end to end neural systems in the past it used to be you know a hybrid of uh some statistical models and some neural models and each of them you know talking to each other uh, but now the need for that is almost vanished where you know a lot of systems especially like the alexas of the world are truly end to end neural systems with very little need for knowledge of linguistics and you know uh, sciences like that it's pretty much gone straight from speech to whatever insight you want directly right so that yeah that's bi- a big change and then uh the uh, variety of transfer transformers based technology that's available for natural language processing is another pretty much table stakes at this point if you are not using transformers in your production systems or at least not planning to then you're kind of you know behind the curve already I haven't heard of transformer technology before. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean transformers are uh you know encoder decoder networks, uh, neural networks. Uh what they can really help us with is uh, uh they can learn 
uh, about a particular domain or concept by just consuming tons of data uh, and completely unsupervised fashion. I see. Then you take that base transformer and then you can, now it has kind of knowledge of the language, right? Or and the world. Now you take that and fine tune it for your particular use case. And that fine tuning is a relatively inexpensive process. So again, it makes it feasible for companies to take those big transformers, apply it to your use case, fine tune with a little bit of data and you're ready to go. Interesting. Now, would this be used as you globalize a system to deal with multiple languages or accents on the same language? Yeah, uh, most transformers that get released today in the open source also have a multilingual equivalent. I see. Though not to the same, you know, quality as the monolingual systems like the Englishes and the you know, top five languages, but they are definitely evolving very rapidly. And a lot of governments, especially like in India, there are multilingual uh, transformers being a uh, development of those being funded by the government and some of the research institutions. Um, for more than a year now, you've been the uh, vice president of applied AI at, at Unifor. Um, what factors do you consider in that role when you choose the right data sets to train uh, the AI models? Yeah, so at uh, Unifor, we have a pretty wide, um, you know, variety of customers in several domains, uh, all the way from telcos to insurance to banking and so on. So one size does not fit all. We, we right. know that. Yet we strive for having good baseline day zero systems on a, you know, when we release our product um, and uh, and then as a second stage, we do the fine tuning and verticalization of these models. So we, we build vertical specific models and so on. So that's, you know, I would say the general approach is make sure that your initial data sets cover a wide enough variety of domains, but you also look for data sets that are domain specific so you can go deep into that domain and build good day zero performance. I see. Uh, what do you think of the innovations that we can expect in the near future in conversational AI? And and how do you how does Unifor sort of stay on the on on the leading edge of that? Yeah, I think uh, you know the innovations will become feasible uh, more from a use case standpoint. The underlying NLP and ASR, of course, as accuracies increase, you can take on more complex use cases. So that's a given. Uh, but beyond that the efficiency with which we are able to deploy these uh, models and removing the need for any further fine tuning that you know that's the next wave of innovation that we have to think about how do we make that time to value really short today deploying in a complex uh, use case can take months we need to get that down to you know a couple of weeks it should be like Oh yeah, I opened an account with Office 365 and you know, voila, I'm ready to use, right? right? We need to get to that level of sophistication with deployments. Right. Does that mean a sort of a commodification or, or a fixed product set that is able to adapt after the user initiates it or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to uh, put it is, you know, I think commoditization so that the basic functionality is just there all you know you, if i sell go sell unifor products to a bank 80 percent of these use cases should already be taken care of they don't need to do any tuning right you go to deployment with that and uh, using the tools which are also powered by ai you can tune the system which will give you feedback on how you are doing with the tuning effort and so on eliminate the need for big professional services costs and you know bring value that way um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and w wanted to ask is there are there any points that i haven't asked you about that you'd like to uh you'd like to get across uh, particularly for people that are, are planning on, on listening to your presentation next month yeah, I think, uh, you know, we kind of touched upon the data piece, but uh, quite superfluously. Uh, the reality is the next wave of work uh, 
is not more on model engineering it is really data engineering how do we make everything data centric uh, the reason uh, for that and you can the term the term that we are using now is called data programming so you're not programming models but you are programming for data where with very simple uh, you know labeling functions you can annotate tons and tons of data very quickly so you don't need a big human human capital investment into these processes with that approach the need uh, the pace at which you can collect data just grows so much right and right. of course the quality of the models yeah. goes up and so on so that's the next big wave that's coming and we are investing heavily into uh, that paradigm of data programming and you know figuring out how that fits into the overall ecosystem uh, that we are building I look forward to your presentation and I uh, want to thank you for your time today. Um, this has been fascinating and, and uh, thank you again.